Hey everyone, my name is Devin. I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of OpenSea. And I am here to talk about the uh, future of NFTs and in particular, OpenSea's Filecoin integration. Maybe slightly less of a technical talk than the other ones, um, but hopefully it uh, should, be, should be fun. So uh, a little background on us, I'll go through these pretty quickly, but um, what is OpenSea? Well, we're a peer-to-peer non-custodial marketplace for NFTs. Um, we also build a lot of tools uh, that allow collectors, creators, and partners to get involved in um, a new economy around the internet. Um, and we've been around since uh, late 2017. Um, so I think most of you are probably familiar with uh, NFTs, but they're put simply, they're unique assets with digital certificates stored and managed on the blockchain. And uh, OpenSea is currently the largest secondary marketplace for NFTs. Uh, we allow any NFT to be bought and sold through a set of smart contracts. Um, something that maybe people don't always recognize about us is that uh, NFTs go far beyond just collectibles. Uh, they can be really all sorts of things. So on OpenSea, there are experiments in, uh, there are, of course, a lot of art projects. There's a lot of collectible projects, but there are also projects around music and audio. Um, there are also things like ENS names, which are more like domain names. Uh, there's photography. And then one of the areas that I'm really excited about is gaming. So uh, virtual worlds and other games have NFT components to them and can be bought and sold on OpenSea. Uh, trading card games, event tickets. There's really a very wide design space for NFTs, despite the recent growing popularity of more collectible focused uh, NFTs. So here's an example. Um, this is a project called Decentraland, which is a virtual world. And one of the really cool things about this virtual world is you can own clothing inside of the virtual world and customize your avatar. So much like you might buy uh, a piece of clothing in Fortnite, you can, you can buy something in this game. Um, but the unique thing is that not only can this NFT live inside of the game itself, right, which is shown here, it can also be bought and sold on secondary marketplaces. And you can imagine even a world where another game developer comes along and decides to integrate this clothing into, into their game as well. Um, so there's these really early experiments in the gaming space that at OpenSea we're, we're really excited about them taking off. Um, so the, this is just sort of a, a reminder of kind of what does it mean to be an NFT? Well, we've had fungible assets like cryptocurrencies um, we have these sort of semi-fungible assets, which um, you know maybe are uh, interchangeable within a class, but non-fungible tokens are these kind of unique, um, one-of-a-kind type things. Um, and then, uh, so now diving a little deeper into uh, the meat of this talk, which is to talk about some of the um, underpinnings of non-fungible tokens. So um, as a review, there are sort of three token standards uh, out there um, today. The first is ERC-20, which many of you are already familiar with. Um, and this is basically a mapping from address to integer, um, which denominates how much of this particular coin a uh, user or an address owns. Um, there's ERC-721, which maps unique identifiers. So for example, CryptoKitty number one to their owner. Right, so ERC-721 sort of says, this unique identifier is owned by this individual or this wallet. Um, and then a new standard uh, that has been um, sort of emerging and popularized over the last few years is ERC-1155. And the interesting thing about this standard is it almost combines ERC-721 and ERC-20 in a single smart contract. So it says there might be many different classes of things and each of those classes are fungible within each other so you could have a class of swords and a mapping of addresses to number of swords and then a class of shields and a mapping there separately. Um, and what's interesting about 1155 is it can actually, um, it is sort of a superset of the functionality of both ERC-20 and ERC-721. So uh, looking deeper now to, to talk about sort of where Filecoin and IPFS uh, come into play, 
it's important to understand the anatomy of one of these standards. So if we look at ERC 721, um, the really important methods to, to uh, think about are uh, owner of uh, is one of them. And owner of basically tells you for a particular unique identifier, who is the owner of that particular NFT, right? So that's really one of those core methods uh, that kind of encapsulates what uh, NFTs or, or digital ownership is all about. It's really just being able to look up the owner. And then the second really important method is uh, transfer from. So the ability to transfer that uh, particular token ID from one address to another. And of course, this is only uh, this is permissioned by the owner of the token ID, right? So if you're not the owner, uh, obviously you shouldn't be able to, to transfer it. And then um, there are other sort of bells and whistles here. Um, for example, approving another address to transfer your tokens, um, which you're probably, those of you who are familiar with ERC-20 uh, probably have seen that before, um, but really owner of and transfer from are kind of the key ingredients for a non-fungible token standard. Now, the question becomes, um, let's say that we have a, uh, an NFT. Um, how do we actually tell the world what that NFT looks like, right? So let's say we have, um, you know, CryptoKitty number one, two, three, four, five. Well, how does the world know that, you know, that's a, a blue CryptoKitty with, uh, you know, this description and these attributes and all of this sort of rich metadata associated with it, um, that is, you know, it's not intuitive, right? From looking at the standard, you know, you see all of these different methods, but, you know, where does it say what the token ID actually is? Like what kind of NFT it is? Um, and so there, that's where token metadata comes into play. So uh, if you look at the ERC-721 standard, there's this method called token URI, um, which returns a URL or URI um, that tells the world where is the metadata associated with this NFT. So um, for example, this token URI might return an HTTP URL um, and that HTTP URL marketplaces such as OpenSea can go and grab the data from um, and, uh, and, and sort of get a sense of what this thing is. So as an example, um, here's some metadata that if you grab, it's actually the, the metadata returned from that URL, you can see um, there's an image, a name, a description, and a, an external URL. And so these are how these, um, this is a little bit of a diagram on, on how all of this fits together. So you have the uh, ERC-721 contract, which of course has owner of, which tells us who owns the NFT. And then you have the token URI, uh, which returns a string. It takes actually it should take in a token ID here and returns a string. Um, and then this URI returns the metadata. And you can see this is an image, a screenshot of how this item would look on OpenSea. You can see the name is here, the description is, is right here, and then there's all of these different traits and properties. Um, and on OpenSea, we actually go and kind of grab all of that metadata, cache it in our own servers so that it can be easily served to the user without us having to go directly to the blockchain and directly to the source of truth. And the other interesting thing about this is, you know, now that there's a standard for, um, uh, for metadata, these items can live in multiple different applications. So this, uh, this is a different like looking creature, but you can imagine the same creature that shows up on OpenSea can then be you know, brought inside of a virtual world uh, like this one, which is called uh, crypto voxels. And this, this open metadata standard really allows any application to go and build an experience around the NFT. Um, in this, we also, uh, one note is that OpenSea provides a convenient API that sort of deals with some of the challenges around massaging the metadata um, merging the on-chain and off-chain data. Um, but the point is that anyone can go and, and build an application that uses this NFT because it's sort of standardized to some extent. Um, so that, I believe this is just the same slide, but uh, so the challenge of course is that we, you know, if we look at, um, for example, 
uh, some of these URLs here, right? You can see that this, the image and the URL itself is just some server, right? So in this case, it's storage on Google APIs, you know, it's, it's hosted on Google, uh, the image. Um, and, you know, we, that, that's not great, right? Because we really want this metadata to stick around and to be um, uh, permanent, right? So that's where IPFS and Filecoin really come into play is sort of where do we host this metadata for, for NFTs? Of course, we could store them, store it on chain, but storing entire images and lots of text on chain tends to be pretty expensive. So that's where OpenSea kind of, you know, started to work more closely with IPFS and Filecoin. And we really wanted to create an experience for people creating NFTs that would allow them to have permanent storage of their, their metadata. Um, but we did have some design requirements on our side. So on our side, we really wanted a, um, a flow that was easy to use and um, wouldn't be extremely high cost for every single user. Right. So we didn't want people to have to pay tons of money uh, or even really have to submit a transaction in order to mint a new NFT. Um, but we also wanted uh, power users to be able to create these decentralized, unstoppable NFTs that do have uh, fully decentralized metadata. So what we came up with for our end product was allowing people to mint NFTs for free. So I'm not going to talk about it in this talk, but we have a system whereby uh, users can mint NFTs, uh, what we call lazy minting. Um, so without having to submit an on-chain transaction, and we default to metadata that's stored on our own servers. Um, but then we also allow users to freeze their metadata um, by uploading to um, IPFS and setting their, their token URI um, by submitting an on-chain transaction. Um, and in terms of how we implemented this solution, uh, we use the NFT storage service, uh, which was sort of a convenient wrapper around um, some of the lower level IPFS and Filecoin APIs. Um, we did this asynchronously on our back end. So we would have uh, a queuing system that went and uh, uploaded the um, metadata and our front end would kind of pull for, um, for monitoring the status there. And then um, we also, at OpenSea, we do everything through GraphQL. So we had this sort of like wrapper API that made a lot of this stuff more convenient uh, for, for the front end. Um, so yeah, now I'll go into a quick demo of uh, how this looks on our website. So it's a screen. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, OpenSea has a, a test nets environment. So it's called testnets.opensea.io. And um, what's interesting about this test nets environment is it's sort of a version of OpenSea, but uh, everything lives on the Rinkeby blockchain, uh, which is, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but it's uh, you know sort of a, a version of Ethereum, a testnet version of Ethereum. So this is like, you can kind of think of it as a, a whole different OpenSea experience on the testnets uh, blockchains. So uh, this is our creator tool. Uh, so I'll go here from, Insight. So you click create, um, and this allows uh, users to create brand new NFTs in sort of a self-serve way without having to go and deploy their own smart contracts and develop them develop it themselves. So um, if we go here um, and upload a new uh, image, we'll say um, IPFS test NFT. Um, and we can include, uh, so we can include lots of rich metadata about this thing. So we'll make it a link to a website um, and we'll give it a description. Um, we added it to a particular collection. Um, and uh, another thing that's kind of cool about um, our collection or our uh, item creators, is we can give it properties. So, um, uh, the um, you can give it uh, numeric traits. So this is just kind of me demoing stuff. Um, uh, 
Uh, you can also do other things, but we'll, we'll skip those. And um, what's cool now is so we're, we're all ready to create. Um, we click create. And um, because I've already signed um, my with my Ethereum wallet, um, you'll you see that I didn't actually have to submit any transactions to do this um, because I'd already authenticated with my um, Ethereum wallet. And now the NFT is sort of lazily created. So it hasn't actually been minted on chain. Um, but when we first sell it, it will become minted. Um, and what's nice about this, again, from a design perspective or sort of from a user experience perspective, is we can onboard users a lot more easily um, without having to um, you know, have them pay tons of money and gas, right? Because at the end of the day, OpenSea is really a product that attempts to sort of make this technology more accessible to the mainstream. And so um, we, we really wanted to make it as easy as possible to create your first NFT. Now, um, but, you know, we go here into details and we see that um, we have the contract address, the token ID, um, uh, but the metadata is editable, right? So because the metadata has been um, uh, put on OpenSea servers, uh, it means that, like, we can go and edit it, right? And what we want to do is we want to actually create an NFT that's completely decentralized and does not... Um, uh, is not editable by users. And so we go back here and we go to freeze metadata. And this will use uh, NFT storage, IPFS, um, to uh, sort of permanently, um, uh, bold, it'll to do two things. Um, so we can click freeze here. So first it's going to upload the metadata to IPFS. So that's what's happening right now, which takes a little while. And then um, the user will um, submit a transaction, which I can do right now, um, to do set URI on the item, which basically sets the IPFS URI for this particular token ID um, and permanently saves the metadata. So I'll click confirm here, and then we'll just wait for the transaction to process. All right, so the transaction is processed. Um, we can go and look at it here. And then now when we go to this item, um, we can look at the details again. And instead of saying editable, you can see that the metadata is frozen. Um, and if we click on this, we can actually see the IPFS URL um, for, for this particular metadata. So you can see, um, you know, the, the image was actually uploaded to IPFS, right, under slash image. Um, and then the rest of this, the properties, the external URL name description are kind of what, what we see here. Um, the other note here is that um, uh, we, we actually will, you know, one of the things that OpenSea does is, is we'll go and sort of monitor the different NFT contracts to tell users and inform them um, whether metadata is frozen or whether it's uh, on chain or sorry off chain or on chain, um, and to sort of educate users about or especially power users about whether these NFTs are truly decentralized or whether they're more uh, centralized NFTs. Again, I, I actually don't think there's anything wrong with um, sort of NFTs that use centralized APIs, uh, uh, I think often that can be the right thing for like a game or something where, um, where you don't necessarily need as much um, decentralization, but uh, for art pieces, I think, you know, it can often be important to collectors to be able to see that their metadata is not going to sort of be taken out from under them. Um, so uh, I think that's sort of the demo uh, piece of it. Of course, we can go and sell this NFT and all that. Um, so then back to the finishing up the presentation. Um, so uh, um, in terms of future opportunities, uh, I think one, the, this is sort of more broadly speaking, um, to where could NFTs go in the future? Well, I think there's actually a lot of room to improve on metadata standards and make them richer and more interoperable and just allow you to represent all sorts of things. You know, you can imagine 
broadcasting that something is an event ticket or a game item or something like that. Um, there's opportunities for on-chain composability. And then of course, there's like tons of opportunities to expand to new blockchains and also to layer two uh, scaling solutions. And uh, yeah, just the last thing is that uh, OpenSea is actively hiring developers. So, um, you know, we're always looking for folks uh, to join the team either on the like sort of blockchain side or even just people who are excited about building consumer facing applications on top of blockchains. Um, so definitely reach out to me if you're interested in a uh, position. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much, Devin. That was actually really interesting to see that done um, in real time um, with the demo. So I just have a couple questions. Um, yeah. How many creators are using the freeze metadata function and utilizing IPFS for, for their NFTs? Oh, man. I, if you had given me that question ahead of time. I <laughs> Sorry. I, Sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. But like, is there um, uh, even like a range that you would know of? Um. Let me, let me pull that up while you ask me other questions. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, well, so I guess the other question I had was, as you've talked to creators who are using OpenSea, is there hurdles that they talk about in utilizing IPFS and Filecoin that maybe the Filecoin ecosystem should think about as they develop upgrades um, to make this easier for creators? Yeah. Um, well, I think, I mean, uh, I, I can get, bring that to my team and, 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 uh, you know, see if they have any feedback, but I, I do think like, um, you know, for the most part, the NFT storage API was uh, really friendly to use. Um, I think, um, I don't know what the state of like NFT tutorials that sort of bundle together, like issuing NFTs and, and, and having metadata. So the developer, like we try to make our creator tools as easy as possible and kind of, simple for, for users, but um, I think anything that helps like a uh, developer go from zero to fully decentralized NFT with metadata uh, would be valuable, right? So like just a sort of higher level um, API for, for doing that, you know, I think would be cool, but that might already exist, so. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, and then in terms of, you had sort of talked about some NFTs probably don't need to be on IPFS. Um, and so I guess if you can talk about those two differences that you're seeing in the NFT market, like what is that narrative in terms of, you know, these like fine art NFTs, if you could call this, <laughs> this group of people fine art at this point, I mean, I think some of it's very fine, but, um, so maybe the fine art needs to be on IPFS, but like you were talking about the gaming. So just expand on that part a little bit. Yeah, sure. And I have a, a few numbers in terms of, uh, kind of the, um, number of people using this frozen metadata stuff. So it's been okay. growing, uh, significantly. So, it looks like in September we had around 78,000 unique um, uploads of metadata. So that that's not uniqueified by user, um, but it's sort of number of of times someone had uh, people have uploaded metadata, which is I mean maybe it's not a huge number, but I do think that this is a pretty like hidden sort of power user feature and the fact that it's been growing. I think in August it looks like it was 25,000, so significantly up from that. I think. Dem I, I'm pretty excited about, you know, that number of uh, people using the feature. And, and again, it's, you know, it's sort of a, a feature that is really just for people who are creating NFTs, not just people who are buying. Um, but then, yeah, the ans to answer your question, yeah, I, I think it's a good, or it's a good question of whether all the data needs to be decentralized. I, I guess, I guess maybe it's just sort of a practical consideration. Like if you're building a game where the, for example, a lot of games sort of generate their game items deterministically based on like the properties of the thing, right? It's, it's hard to manage like, um, uploading, you know, to a decentralized file system for every single different game item. And then the other point there is just like, you know, if the game goes away, then the game items kind of not very useful anymore. So even if the metadata was like stored on some on the on a decentralized file system, well, you can't play the game anymore, right? So it's like there's already sort of a central point of failure, and so how much does it matter whether the the metadata is centralized versus not? That's kind of my point. 
I see. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought of that. Although I guess there's this broader narrative that you're um, like your skins or your characters in one game, if that game fails, maybe you'll be able to take it into a different game. And so if you really love that character, maybe that is worth it to have that, you know, persistent over web three. Um, yeah, I think in the future, like, yeah, it's more of a practical consideration, like in the future, when we have like, unstoppable games that are like built on peer-to-peer -peer systems and like you know there's no more games like centralized game server i don't know maybe that i think that's much further down the road but when you can create those sorts of things i think having everything be decentralized is super important but a lot of games are just like sort of this hybrid right now yeah, that's fair. Okay, um, Devin, thank you so much for joining us at Filecoin Orbit. That was awesome. Like I said, I really thoroughly enjoyed having that demo. I, I learned by experience, and so that was great. So thanks so much. Thanks for um, having me.